We are delighted to have with us again CEO and founder of Zero Time Selling, Andy Paul. Andy Paul is the leading expert on selling with speed. With more than 30 years in the sales business as a successful sales professional and sales vice president in companies ranging from raw startups to Fortune 1000, Andy is a frequently sought after speaker, executive sales coach, and sales process consultant. Andy is also the author of the award-winning book, Zero Time Selling, 10 Essential Steps to Accelerate Every Company's Sales and Amp Up Your Sales, Powerful Strategies That Move Customers to Make Fast, Favorable Decisions. We are delighted to have with us today, Andy Paul. And with that, welcome, Andy. Thank you, Taylor. And thank you, everybody, for taking the time of your busy days to join us here today. So we're going to talk about winning the sale before you win the order. And I want to lead off by asking a question of everybody here. Is how much did you win your last deal by? I mean, what was, what was your margin, your winning margin of victory? I mean, was it, were you 5% better than the other guys? Were you 12%, maybe 23%? I mean, have you ever quantified that, or is it even possible to quantify? Well, the fact is that really you only really need to be 1% better than your competitors to win the business. And in markets where increasingly there's been an influx of competitors into virtually every market segment and in the mind's eye of our buyers, increasingly the vendors are all sort of interchangeable, look pretty much alike. This 1% margin of difference is really essential. And there's an emerging body of study in sales that talk about this issue of tie-breaking selling. You know, when you're in these hyper-competitive markets where there's lots of competitors, and customers have a hard time choosing on what basis do they begin to make their choice. And what they're finding in this research is that it's the intangibles that are the basis of which buyers are making their choices. And so I want to talk today about how those intangibles lead up to this moment, what I call winning the sale. And that's the moment when you know the customer has made a decision that they're going to do business with you. Now, this isn't the same as winning the order. I remember in my days selling, I, at one point in my career, was selling very large, complex communication systems worth tens of millions of dollars. And I would know, oftentimes, a year before I got the order that I was actually going to win the sale. I had won the sale, and I was going to get their business. And it was as a result of the application of a lot of these intangibles, these tiebreakers, that make the difference between you and everybody else. And so I'm going to share with you some very specific examples of ways that you can apply these intangibles to help win the sale, put you in the, the leading position to make sure you win the order with the prospect. So I talked before, we've got this situation now that's happening in more and more market segments where, as vendors, everybody basically looks alike to the customers. You know, the barriers to entry to so many of our new technology markets have been lowered, uh, the cost of getting into markets has been lowered, and as a result, products and services are pretty rapidly commoditized. And so a challenge for us as sellers is how do we avoid becoming what I call a sales commodity? And increasingly, again, referring back to what I talked to before about these tiebreakers, these intangibles, is that the way that you win is based less on what you sell even though we all love our products and services and they are important, but increasingly decisions are being made on how we sell to the prospect, how we establish relationships and the value we deliver through how we sell to the customer. And it's how you sell that enables you to, what I call, win the sale, to reach that moment where the customer has made that decision in their mind that you are the vendor, you are the seller that they want to do business with. So we're going to talk about several steps that go into this building this intangible advantage that truly differentiates you from your competitors. And one of the first steps is to really be focused on how do you optimize the first impressions, or what I call the first perceptions, that you create when you first interact with your buyers. In my most recent book, Amp Up Your Sales, I talk a lot about the, discuss the research that's been done into this, the science of how people form perceptions. And what the science tells us is that when you first meet a person, they're making a judgment about you within the first 250 milliseconds of meeting you, within the first quarter second, the time it takes to blink an eye. 
is they're starting to form an impression of you and whether you are going to be suitable for them as a partner going forward. I like to quote from Ralph Waldo Emerson, you know, what you do speak so loudly, what you do speak so loudly, I cannot hear what you say. And that really speaks to this business of being deliberate about how you form these first impressions in the mind of the customer. Because the first impressions build trust. Now, there's been a book that's just been published recently called Presence, uh, written by a Harvard professor and researcher named Amy Cuddy. And in it, with some colleagues, she did extensive research about the power of first impressions and how they shape the ultimate relationship you have with people. And looked at it both in personal and a business context. And when people meet people for the first time, they're trying to answer two questions. One is, can I trust this person? And two is, can I respect this person? And translate into business terms, she said, you know, this translates into trust and competence. You know, can I trust this, this company, this seller, and do they have the competence to help me solve my problem? And she said through the research, they found that business people tended to believe that the buyers want to answer the competence question and that competence builds trust. And what they actually found was the opposite, that really trust leads to the acceptance of your competence. And so first impressions, how you first engage with that prospect, the impression you make, really becomes essential. And so what that translates into the sales sense is that there is no such thing as an unimportant sales interaction. Meaning that you have to bring your A game every time you interact with that prospect, especially important near the beginning, because in that beginning, they're starting to make judgments about you as a potential vendor, a suitable vendor for them in the long term. Oops. So first perception is very powerful, and we like to talk about the law of attraction. And Oftentimes it's taken off context. What the law of attraction says is that positive perceptions bring about positive results. And so if you think about in the case of selling, is that you're creating these, the power of the first perceptions, first impressions, you're creating the mind of the customer, really lead to them making long-term judgments. They're making judgments about the long-term value that you bring to them based on just those first interactions. So you think about in the context of not just your sales, let's say you have a sales development team, your sales development reps reaching out, making first contact with customer, it may scheduling a meeting or a demo for one of your account execs, and then your account exec coming in, there's two opportunities there for creating first impressions that could be absolutely decisive to your ability to win the business. You know, we tend to be uh, very much enraptured in love as sales leaders with sales enablement technologies and our sales processes. But the fact is, at the end of the day, it's still, this is a business that's about people talking to people and people building trust with people that lead to them being able to choose you. And it starts right at the beginning. So it requires that you be very deliberate. This will be a theme that I'll bring up here in the, the next uh, section I go through. It's very deliberate about how you approach and deal with your customers. You cannot be on autopilot. You can't be acting robotically in your sales process and you know, beating up your sales development reps and your account execs to hit certain numbers of calls and so on. You have to be mindful of the fact that you got people on the other end and based on the quality of that interaction, they may choose to pick you or not. So one of the first things you can do as an intangible, to build up this intangible that leads to you winning the sale is to accelerate your responsiveness. Now, responsiveness in sales has a very specific def definition. It's not about just being fast in by itself because speed by itself doesn't have any value to the customer. So in sales, responsiveness as a definition is it's the combination of information delivered with speed. So if your customers are asking you a question you know, you can get back to it and say, you know, great question, but it's going to take us two days to get back to you. Well, that, that's not helping them, right? Because increasingly, research is showing that customers want to make decisions faster. IDC, the research company, had a report that came out a year or so ago saying that in the business-to-business -business space, certainly in the IT space and a couple other segments, customers want to make decisions up to 40% faster. And what's holding them back 
are us, the sellers, because we're not being responsive to their need for information on a timely basis. Give an example is IBM. About two years ago, a little less than two years ago, the CEO of IBM, Virginia Romney, sent out a video message to the entire workforce saying that you know, IBM was being hammered by their competition because they weren't being responsive to their customers and their potential buyers. And so she put a stake in the ground and said, look, anytime there's an inquiry from a customer, an existing customer, a new potential new customer, we will get back to them within 24 hours with the answer. Now, we could argue whether 24 hours is really fast enough, but the point is they put a stake in the ground. They had a metric that they were measuring. And I guarantee is once they got their customers accustomed to getting fast response to questions, they would be doing it even quicker because it becomes a competitive advantage for them. It becomes one of those intangibles that the customers say, yeah, I like doing business with them because when I have a question, I get a fast answer. And the research, again, into the, how people are making decisions is showing that the first seller with the answers increased, dramatically increases their odds of winning the business. And I'll have some additional statistics on that coming up. But just being first, again, creates that impression in the mind of the customer of reliability. It starts building trust. This is a partner I can work with. And if all things are being, else are being relatively equal, that's going to tip the scales in your favor. So our corollary follow-on to accelerate your responsiveness is to follow up faster. You know, we have this sort of bifurcated demand generation system that many companies have. We use a combination of proactive outbound prospecting. We also use our content marketing and our marketing automation to have generate inbound leads. And the ability to follow up fast on your inbound leads again, creates an incredibly positive impression in the mind of the prospect. Industry statistics, a study done by a company InsideSales.com, a tool that some of you may use, found that 73% of inbound leads are still not followed up. Think about that, 73% are never followed up. And so think about the impression you make on a customer when you do follow up. And if you follow up quickly, and if you follow up responsively with the information they need, to move forward in their buying process. A study that was done last year, I believe by Serious Decisions, found that 51% of orders go to the first seller to contact the buyer. So if, the, if your buyer has sent you a lead, you automatically establish yourself in an advantageous position in a competitive sense just by picking up the phone and calling them. And if you do it faster, another study has shown that your ability to convert a lead into a prospect, your conversion ratio goes up dramatically the faster you call back. Uh, one study found that if you were able to call back, respond to a lead within five minutes versus 30 minutes, you increase the odds of turning them into a prospect by 100 times. Not 100%, but 100 times more likely to be able to convert them into a prospect by the rapid follow-up. And the other thing with responsive follow-up, when you do it rapidly and you have the answers to the customer's questions, you create this lasting perception in the customer's mind about the experience of working with your company. I had a client once that was getting a fair number of leads on the inbound side. It was taking about four business days on average to respond to those. And within about a week or two, we changed that process around where they suddenly were following up of all leads within 30 minutes. And one of the dramatic impacts was is that they suddenly started converting so many more of those leads into orders. And in many cases, they were converting customers from their competitors as well that were looking for a new solution. And it was all due to the fact that they were just being responsive, quickly following up, and removing the customer's incentive to go out and talk to other vendors. So a little graph here, graph A, a typical sort of sales cycle, and this is pulled from my most recent book, Amp Up Your Sales, and there was research done by a Nobel Prize winning economist named Daniel Kahneman about how people make decisions, and he formulated this rule called the peak end rule. And what I said when people go through a, an experience and they look back to make a decision about it, let's say like a, go through a buying process, 
they remember two things that they primarily factor into their decision. One is the peak event in that experience and the last event in that experience. So if we look at that and translate that into a sales perspective, is that if you assume that the events in a buying process, you know, that are your touch points with the customer, is that oftentimes just the mere fact you follow up and follow up responsibly with the prospect, that can be the peak event that the prospect or the buyer remembers when they go to make their decision. Something intangible, as we talked about, just the speed of response it can very well be the peak event if the alternative was a competitor who didn't respond in a responsive fashion. Another way to increase the power of the intangibles through to your selling and how you sell is to maximize the value that you deliver when you sell. At the heart of sales interaction, every sales interaction, every sales touch, is this exchange. The customers give you time and they expect to receive something of value in return. You know, they're going to make a judgment on every sales interaction, whether that was a good use of their time or a bad use of their time. Did they get an ROI on the time they invested in you or if they did not? And if you stop providing value for the prospect, then we've all been in a case at some point in our careers where customers go radio silent and we thought they were a good prospect. Well, we're often left scratching our heads why that's happened. Well, oftentimes it's because they've made that judgment that we're just not worth their time. They weren't getting a value for the time they were investing in us. And so back to this concept I talked about earlier about deliberate mindful selling, is this is the perfect example of that is you have to be conscious every time you interact with a prospect that you give them some value for the time that they've invested in you. Now value really sort of looks at two different forms, and there's the business value of what you sell, what the value the customers could derive from the product or service that you're selling to them. But there's also value in a sales sense, and it's a term that's thrown around kind of loosely, so I have a very specific definition for it, which is that value is any information that moves the prospect at least one step forward in their buying process. Now, that information could take one of many forms. It could be an insight about how a specific customer, other customers using your product or service and the value they're deriving from it. It could be a sales story that you know, similarly gives some sort of social proof for your product or service. It could be a great question. I think maybe it is data of some sort, but it's information that helps move the prospect at least one step forward, either large or small, in their buying process. And so it's incumbent upon us if we're going to, again, create these intangible differentiators that become tiebreakers for us and how we sell and to be able to win the sale before we win the order, we have to focus on what I call a value plan for every sales touch. And what a value plan says is that there's two components to this interaction. The first one is a goal in terms of what's the value we want to deliver to the prospect using the value definition we just used. And two is the outcome. You know, what, what commitment is the customer going to make to action based on having received this value from us? And so it's incumbent upon sales leaders and sales managers to train their people and to work with their people and to coach their people and their team to say, look, every time you interact with the prospect, every time you're asking the customer to give you some of their time, is we have to have a plan to deliver something of value to them. And so that could be an in-person sales call, it could be a virtual sales call, it could be a, a phone call, but it also tr could be an email. It could be a voicemail where we're asking the customer to do something. It, you know, anytime we have this interaction with the prospect that we're asking some other time, we need to deliver something of value in return. And if you don't have that value plan in place, then I urge you to stop you know, it's better not to spend the customer's time than it is, you know, it's better not to spend if you don't have value to deliver to them. And sometimes doing nothing is better than doing something that, like I said, doesn't deliver the value. So the next thing that aligned with value, but again becomes a clear differentiator and intangible, is to ask insightful questions. And this is a big topic in sales, how do we train our 
our sales development reps, how do we train our account execs to act, ask the right questions. And I'm not going to solve that problem entirely, but here's one thing that you can, can use and to help your people sort of think about this, this question. is what I call the ask, don't tell formula, which is that every time you feel the need to state a fact or to talk about your product or service, is ask a question instead. Because we know if talking about our product and service is not a trust-building step because it's about us, it's not about the customer. And so even if you want to, or your sales rep wants to, let's say, gosh, you must prospect, we've got this great feature, it does A, B, C, D, is instead of making that statement, even if it has a benefit statement attached to it, is think about it as a question instead. As Mr. Prospect, you know, if you had the capability of doing A, B, C, and D, what value would that produce for you? So suddenly you've turned from stating something that may or may not have a receptive value for the prospect to asking a question where through their answer, now you're going to start this process of co-creation of value in developing what is ultimately the best solution for them. And it comes through asking questions. So the ask, don't tell formula becomes very powerful with sales reps on the front line helping to build trust. Because what the buyers need from your sellers is they need your knowledge, they need your insights, they need your expertise, they need your business acumen. And the best way to demonstrate knowledge of the customer's requirements and to provide insights into their needs and demonstrate your expertise and your acumen are through the questions you ask. So the three well-crafted questions convey value quickly and powerfully. And ideally, you would think from a sales presentation standpoint, you know, what I like to work with clients on is say, look, we're going to take this presentation you have and reduce this presentation to a series of questions, and we're going to sideline the PowerPoint slides altogether, and we're just going to ask the customer a number of questions. And the customers intuit and derive knowledge from based on the questions you're asking exactly what your product or service does. So I'd like to provide you with three questions to help open a customer conversation that you can have and provide to either your SDRs or your account execs. And they speak to motivations, challenges, and their sense of urgency. And rather than talking about pain, which I don't think that's a very productive way to talk about pain points with, with prospects, is I like to talk more aspirationally. So what's their motivation for change? And a great question to ask is that, so, you know, where do they want to be in 12 months or 18 months? And so it starts with, sort of, you know, where are you now? Where do you want to be? Next question is then now talks about the challenges, what some people might call the pain points, but what's preventing you from getting there? Apologize for us being a little slow here today. And then the third question, again, having to do with a sense of urgency, is what will happen if you don't achieve your goals? Right? What will happen if you don't change? That's a question that, that customers don't hear very often for salespeople. You know, what happens if you don't, if you don't make this change? And that becomes very powerful ways again, as you start setting yourself apart through delivering value by asking these questions and you open the door to what I can call the co-creation of value with the prospect at this point to say, okay, we're starting to march toward a path to defining your optimum solution. And this becomes a focus on the buyer. As talked before, that's a trust building step. Is that a research done by the Forrester Group found in the business-to-business -business space that your odds of winning in order with the customers are at 65% if you are the seller, the first seller, that shapes the prospect's buying vision. Now, the buying vision is the sort of compelling imagery of uh, mental image of what their ultimate solution is. And so the way you drive at that is you have to be the first to engage them. You have to have built that trust for them to be able to answer the questions, the insightful questions that you ask and that you answer in a responsive fashion. And this mental image, this buyer vision, is a way that they take a mental test drive 
of your product and your service. In that mental test drive, again, based on research and how people make decisions, is an integral part of everybody's decision-making process. A customer can go from point A to point B and various steps along the way, but one of those steps that they will not stick, skip is taking that mental test drive. And the way you do that is you create that buyer's vision, that compelling image of what the solution is going to be. You've gone down that path through the great questions that you asked. You were given the chance to ask great questions because you were first in the door. You accelerated your follow-up. You are responsive in your follow-up. And you were prepared with the questions that created the positive first perceptions and impressions in the mind eye of the customer. It's sort of the flip side of some of this. So I just want to finish up with a few cautionary notes. Is, is that along with winning the sale, as you reach that point, is you have to continuously and ruthlessly disqualify prospects. You know, if you're not winning the sale, then you have to really ask yourself, is this person really a qualified, or this buyer really a qualified prospect for what I'm selling? specifically for what I'm selling. So one example I give in training I use with, with customers, you know, if the customer asks for a proposal, and if you work on a large, complex piece of business, if you don't know at the time you put the proposal in whether you're going to win the order, then you really have to ask yourself whether you have won the sale or if indeed whether you even have a qualified prospect. That's how this breaks down, is if you don't know, if you're not in that position, if you haven't delivered the intangibles, if you haven't delivered the, the value through the selling process, and you don't know whether you're in the position that you're actually going to win it, then you have to ask yourself, is this really a qualified prospect? Should I be continuing to invest time in them, giving them a proposal, and continuing to follow this to an order? And we could spend days talking about forecasting and how you... <laughs> how you assign percentages and likelihood of win, but this is really the bottom line. Because at the end of the day, you stand to lose twice. You know, if you're not delivering the intangibles and you don't have the sense that you're winning the sale, as you stand to lose twice, not only are you going to lose the opportunity, but you're also going to have lost the time that you invested in them that you could have spent on other qualified opportunities. So I appreciate the time. Uh, I guess stay around. We'll answer some questions uh, after uh, Dick Orlando gives a, a few words about Leverage Point. Um, appreciate you taking the time. If you want to connect with me, uh, one is listen to my podcast. I have a daily podcast on sales with the top, top people in the sales world and marketing world every day for half hour. You can find it on my website at andypaul.com or on iTunes or Stitcher. It's called Accelerate with Andy Paul. Connect with me on Twitter or follow me on Twitter and at Zero Time Selling or connect with me on LinkedIn. And there's my, my email address. And also, if you're interested perhaps in pursuing this further, I have an online training product that uh, we offer a free trial. See if it would something be applied to your team if they want to learn some of the in depth, more some of the strategies and tactics I talked about today. And the way to enroll in the free trial is just text the word trust, T R U S T. We talked about that today to 96,000, that's 96,000, and you'll be automatically enrolled. So thank you very much for your time. Great. Thank you, Andy, for those great insights. Um, so, so we have had a few questions come in during the webinar, um, but there's still time to enter your question into the panel on your screen. While you're entering, a reminder to complete the 10-second survey while exiting today's webinar to receive a copy of Customer Value Propositions in B2B Sales and to have the opportunity to receive a copy of Amp Up Your Sales by Andy Paul. Now for the Q&A and a brief word about Leverage Point, I am pleased to introduce Leverage Point's president and COO, Dick Orlando. Thank you, Taylor, and thank you very much, Andy. Um, I've been working with Andy now for, for a couple of years, and he's, he's the real deal. <laughs> if you want to uh, get your sales reps to uh, be a little sharper with, the, with your customers and your prospects, I encourage you to contact Andy. Uh, this is the first time I've done this, but I, I stole a slide from my guest speaker's presentation. And this, this was very impressive. Um, this is what we're all about here at Leverage Point. Uh, we sell to large B2B companies, and most 90% of the people are on the call are there. 
uh, that's what they're doing, and the, the sales cycle is long. And it's about winning every single sales call. It's about adding value in every single sales call. And the thousands of users that we have, um, this is probably the biggest compliment we get, is it helps me move the sale along to the next step by differentiating myself and moving, uh, and, and moving faster than the competition does. The sales cycles are long. They're very, very long. And the beginning of the sales cycle, which Andy did a great job at, is the sales organization that outfits their sales reps with the right presentations to create the value at the beginning of the sales cycle has a tremendous opportunity to win the business. I've talked to literally hundreds of sales VPs and sales leaders uh, over the past few years, and this slide they're saying is conservative. Companies are putting millions and millions of dollars into marketing, as Andy had mentioned. And depending on the type of organization, uh, sometimes you'll have a sales follow-up to qualify the deal, then you pass it on to the field reps, and the field reps then make that decision. Is this a qualified opportunity that I want to put into the sales pipeline and, in essence, extend resources to do that? And according to SBI, of the forecasted deals, 60% of the deals do nothing. That means the major times you lose is no decision or they're to stick with the status quo or they're going to spend the money on another capital project instead of your, instead of your project and of course uh, to competitors. But 60% is more than you will lose more to, to do nothing than you will to the competitors combined. How does this happen? Well, it usually happens at the beginning of the sales cycle and I have a, a very extensive <laughs> conversations with sales VPs about this. And if you think about it, if you don't enter the qualified pipeline, you don't really start the process. And it's either because the sales rep will stand up after they get that qualified lead and they'll do the corporate presentation, the usual 20, 25, 30 slides, introduce the company, and later on we'll get into more detail on the next call. Or they don't have the tools necessary in today's digital age to, to communicate that. And in some cases, the sales follow-up of the inside sales rep and of the outside sales rep now is being combined. And many of our uh, sales VPs are telling me now they're really driving more to an inside sales process uh, in some of the smaller uh, enterprise accounts that we do business with. This quote came from uh, another Boston-based company called, called Cuvidian, which is a sales enablement, uh, one of sales enablement leaders in proposals and RFPs is why, how do reps lose these qualified opportunities early? And it's relatively simple. Put yourself in the, in the place of a sales rep going out to a sales call the next day and you're looking for what is the right content to show. So if I'm calling on a manufacturer of paint, they're, 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 let's say it's a chemical company and, they, and they're calling on a specific customer that's going to put paint on new cars or new trucks. And according to the research, 83% of the salespeople report that they have a very hard time finding the content that they need. There literally is 3,000 sales enablement vendors out there. A lot of them work on the assumption that they have a qualified deal, a qualified opportunity. Well, what if it isn't qualified yet? Well, they need to get the right content. And worse yet, when the rep can't find the content, what do they do? They abandon the search, they get frustrated, they, they'll use a, the standard corporate pitch in, in PowerPoint slides. In some cases, they'll use outdated materials, and often that leads to a missed sale because of the exact reasons that Andy Andy had mentioned. Leverage point users, and I don't, I will not give a demo today. I don't have time for that. Uh, but leverage point sales users early on in the sales cycle have this master value proposition that's been created by marketing. And just think about this. You announce a brand new product. You have hundreds of sales reps out there that want to, um, that'll, that'll have the responsibility to sell this product. And, and, and then whether you be a vice president of product management, product marketing, VP of sales, or even the CEO, what do you want those 300 reps to say on a first important sales call that creates value for the customer? Well, what better is it if you take a master value proposition, which is a, really a, a compilation of all your expertise for this particular area, because you have dozens of customers or hundreds of customers that are doing this, and you show them a digital 
um, pr presentation that, that shows the ROI you're going to deliver to somebody, the value you deliver to somebody, you show it in graphical form as, as to um, what it looks like from a, from a pricing standpoint, either versus the way you're doing it today or status quo. Underneath that, that graph, you see the assumptions that you use with the, with, with the numbers that you use, and under that, you even break it out a little bit more and, and, and show the customer how you calculated this and show it in a pie chart. And the last line there is your most current collateral that you want people to show somebody in this fictitious Dean Chemicals advanced coding solution, maybe a video or a case study. Now this looks relatively simple, but this probably entails 35 to 40 current PowerPoint presentation slides that, that your reps are giving today. Most of our successful sales reps are, are showing something like this to clients seven, eight minutes into the sales presentation to qualify a customer, is this something you'd be interested in doing, which we have done for lots and lots of customers. And, late, and later, you can get on our website and you can see that you can then customize this to the individual customer if you would like. And the beauty of this is you don't need to spend a lot, the rep doesn't need to spend a lot of time to get specific data from the customer they're calling on. The whole ROI impact of something like this is early on in the sales cycle. You establish yourself as one of the companies that the uh, customer wants to do business with. And the sales VPs say, when I ask them the question, what's the one thing I can do for you? And they say, we have a great sales methodology. Our challenge is increasing the qualified sales pipeline that we get. We were just working on too many deals we shouldn't be working on. But if I could just do that, that would be great. Okay? And what, what does that mean in dollars and cents? Well, the middle of the sales force are your bag carrying sales reps each and every day. They're out there giving the most demos, the most transactions. So in this particular case, if you take 200 sales reps in the organization, 80% is 160. And the average sale you have is $100,000. If through this process, and it works, that you get one additional qualified sales opportunity per rep, that equals $16 million additional of qualified sales opportunities in the pipeline. And even if you have a close, low close rate of 20 to 30 percent of these qualified opportunities, that's anywhere from a $3 million to a $5 million improvement in revenue that hits the bottom line. That's huge. So, as you can tell, Leverage Point is the leader in creating digital web-based value propositions that increase your sales pipeline. And we subscribe to the Steve Jobs quote that basically says, people who know what they're talking about don't need PowerPoint. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Dick. And I see that we've had some good questions come in so far during the webinar. Um, and to answer the most popular one myself, yes, this webinar is recorded and the slides and recording will be sent to you within two business days via email. So be on the lookout for that. Um, and to get going, uh, the first question we have is for Andy. How does a manager or should a manager train or coach sales to sell this way? Um, well, <laughs> yeah, maybe we should focus on coaching, uh, the coaching part of it. And it's really, it's a mind shift for everybody involved just to say, look, we're going from just operating on autopilot and being purely metrics driven to incorporating quality in, and mindfulness into our, our selling, which is we're going to be very deliberate about how we approach each sales touch. And it really requires a deeper level of involvement from the sales manager on a coaching standpoint as they're doing pipeline reviews is to ask questions you know, of each account that the rep has is, you know, what value, what information does the prospect need from us at this point in time to take the next step in their sales pro in their buying process? And if you can start coaching from that, if you start training sales reps to focus on this idea of value added through how they sell, you know, a perfect example is give a reference to one client I worked with where, you know, we train the salespeople to understand that Every time they communicate with the 
with the buyer, and let's say that's just through email, is that they always attached a white paper or a link to a third-party report, you know, that was from their content library that they said they had a hard time finding content, but there's ways to do it even more easily using Google Alerts and so on that you can serve up data. But they started training the customers to every time that they got a communication from their sales rep, there was something there to help them better understand the challenges they're facing, better understand the solution that they're looking to buy. And it just required, let's say, a different mindset in terms of how you coached salespeople and how they looked at how they should be interacting with the prospect. And that wasn't just purely about, hey, I need to make my 50 calls today, but when I'm doing my follow-up, when I'm engaging, I'm answering this question. Yeah, there is something of value there for the prospect. Great, thank you. And I'll send this next question over to Dick. Uh, do you need exact data to create a master value proposition? <laughs> That's the one I get by far most most often. And and I'll say I'll give you two answers. To that. No, and absolutely no. You you don't want to send a sales rep on the first initial important call with the customer thinking that they have the exact data for them. What, you, what the rep really wants to do is first establish credibility, that I have the information at hand based on our experience with many other customers like you that I'd like to share with you to see if you have an interest in attaining the same results that they have. And the data is, is already put into the master value proposition by the by the marketing department and it's real simple working with us and that creates collaboration with the customer so in the example I use 40,000 cars if you if you're if you're selling paint the car dealers or car manufacturers and if they say 75,000 now you have an opportunity to not only change that in a, in a digital smart value proposition to say 75,000 and see the impact on the results. But now what you've done is you're collaborate, collaborating with the customer and it should, the customer is engaged and now the customer is doing what? They're creating their own value proposition. It's very, very powerful. And customers, we have a proof of concept process here and we, we give them, we create a massive value proposition for them and the, Proof of concept process usually lasts, lasts about 30 days. Half the time, within the 30 days, sales reps, being sales reps, will run out and actually show something that we created as a massive, massive value proposition and say, it worked. And definition of it, it worked is, my customer listened, I established my credibility, then they started asking me to change some of the assumptions that I made in the value proposition. And that basically is a huge win for any sales rep on a, on a first sales call. Great, thank you. And Andy, I'll send this one over to you. Uh, as customers always end up asking about price, how can you direct them away from, from this question? Oh, I don't think you should, actually. So, um, yeah, I know there's a, a fear about talking about price too soon, but in my mind, you can't, you can't talk about value unless you're also talking about price. I mean, you can't, and you know, Dick just had it on his slides there. Is, you, know, you, can't, you can't quantify value the customer's going to receive from something unless they understand the level of investment that they're going to make, right? You can't give an ROI unless you know how much you have to invest. And so, yeah, I don't think people need to be afraid of talking about price. If you should talk about price in the context of the value you're going to provide and use that as a way to qualify the prospect. You know, if the prospect you say, look, if you get the customer, and qualification to me is you know, a very simple formula, is the customer agrees that the value they're going to receive is worth a certain amount of dollars investment on their part, and hopefully that is you know, aligned with what your price is. And if it's not, then you have to say, maybe they're not a prospect for what I'm selling. Great, thank you. And this looks like the last question we have uh, for today, um, unless any more come in uh, during this answer, but do you have any examples of how the importance of insightfulness or the value of speed has helped in a, a rep or, or you in a selling situation? Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I referenced a little bit earlier 
<coughs> in in the presentation is is uh, you know the IBM example where they decide that speed of responsiveness suddenly became really important. You know, not only to get the answers back, but get answers question or get them back time in a timely basis. Excuse me. I mean, that's that's huge. You know, that's when the company with all the resources in the world and all the management disciplines said, "Look, we are failing at this most basic task, which is just being responsive to our customers." And they decided it's important enough that that they were going to make a company mandate out of it. And so it's a metric worth worth having is, you know, how long should it take to get back to a customer when they have a question? How long should it take to follow up the sales lead? And once you start measuring that and putting it into your process, you begin, find, you begin to find that what you want to do is you want to do it even faster because you see the impact it has on the prospects. And I gave the example of that one client that took it from four days to 30 minutes to follow up every lead without introducing a new product it was of any sort of substantial nature over the following two years of making that change they doubled their sales and it was largely based on the increase in responsiveness to prospects yeah I have I have thank you Mandy I have something to as an example of one of the most consistent comments we get from salespeople is how they get customers speaking about value that they expect from from us or from the vendor when they're presenting these value propositions. And specifically there was a there was an example where they were involved in a six month sales cycle and the leverage point solution was was brought in and the sales rep brought in the value proposition and the CFO happened to be sitting there and the CFO looked at this and he says, finally and he says, finally what? He says, finally it, we're talking about the cost savings that we can have as a result of this solution. I'm very interested. Let's get our teams together and start working this. So they broke that log jam because CFO wasn't convinced. And about a month later, they were able to get a $3 million deal. It, it, it's huge. It's absolutely huge when you're talking about the customer's issue of how to save money, or how to increase revenue versus talking about just what your product can do for them. Great. Thank you. Um, and I just want to thank everyone for being able to attend today, um, and Andy and Dick for your time today as well.